Olá, como vocês estão? Espero que estejam todos bem. Sejam bem-vindas e bem-vindos ao primeiro Congresso Internacional de Humanidades, Digitais, Cultura e Ensino e o segundo Simpósio Nacional em Mídias, Tecnologias e História, ambos organizados pelo grupo de pesquisa MITEX, coordenado pelo professor Dr. Jorge Leonardo Seabra Coelho, com sede na Universidade Federal do Tocantins. Eu sou Rodrigo, professor mestre em literatura e crítica literária e editor administrativo da revista Interação da Universidade Federal de Goiás. E estarei como mediador da mesa intitulada Videogame, Cultura e História, Autenticidade ou Entretenimento. Para nos ajudar na dinâmica, temos a estudante Tatiana Almeida e a professora Essa Pereira. Para compor a mesa, temos a professora Ruth Contreiras Espinosa, da Universidade Autônoma de Barcelona, professor Nick Weber, da Birmingham Center for Media and Cultural Research, e professor Esther Wright, da Universidade Cardiff, país de Gales. Cada conferencista tem entre 20 e 30 minutos para exposição e, ao fim de suas falas, abriremos para o debate. Como nós temos professores é, estrangeiros, eu também farei essa apresentação em inglês e espanhol. Hello, how are you? I hope you are well. Welcome to the first International Congress on Digital Humanities, Culture and Education, and the second National Symposium on Media, Technologies and History, both being organized by the Mitex Research Group, coordinated by Professor Jorge Leonardo Seabra Coelho from Federal University of Tocantins. I am Rodrigo, professor with master degree in literature and literacy critics, and administrative editor of the journal Interação from Federal University of Goiás. And I will be the mediator of the conference entitled Video Games, Culture and History, Authenticity or Entertainment. To help us with the dynamics, we have Tatiana Almeida, undergraduate student, and Professor Essa Pereira. On the panel are Professor Ruth Contreras Espinosa from the Universidade Autónoma de Barcelona, Professor Nick Weber from Birmingham Center for Media and Cultural Research, and Professor Esther Wright from Cardiff University. Each speaker will have 20 to 30 minutes for their presentation, and at the end of their speeches, we will open up for debate. Olá, como estão? Espero que se encontre bem. Bem-vindos ao primeiro Congresso Internacional de Humanidades Digitales, Cultura e Enseñanza e ao segundo Simpósio Nacional de Medios, Tecnologias e História, organizados por el Grupo de Pesquisa Mitex, coordenado por el Professor Dr. Jorge Leonardo Seabra Coelho, com sede na Universidade Federal de Tocantins. Sou Rodrigo, professor com master em literatura e crítica literária e serei mediador em la mesa titulada Virojuegos, Cultura e História, Autenticidade ou Entretenimento. Para nos ajudar com a dinâmica, temos a estudante Tatiana Almeida e a professora Essa Pereira. Para compor a mesa, contamos com a professora Ruth Contreras Espinosa, da Universidade Autônoma de Barcelona, o professor Nick Weber, do Birmingham Center for Media and Cultural Research, e a professora Esther Wright, da Universidade de Cardiff. Cada um deles terá entre 20 e 30 minutos para responder, e ao final de suas, de suas intervenções, abriremos um debate. Ah, então, para começarmos os trabalhos, tenho o prazer em convidar a professora Esther Wright. So, just for now, I'd like to invite professor Esther Wright. Thank you so Hello, much. Hello, Professor. Um, uh, before, I, before you start your speech, I'm going to summarize your resume, okay? Uh, professor Esther Wright, her work is situated within the field of historical game studies, and to her, digital history fundamentally requires that we critically examine how digital representations of the past found in popular visual media have the potential to shape public understandings of history. Her monograph, Rockstar Games and American History, Promotional Materials and the Construction of Authenticity, was published by the Grutier in 2022 as part of the Video Games and the Humanity series. Based on her PhD thesis, awarded by the University of Warwick in August 2019, the book is the first substantive study of the Rockstar Games as a game developer with a long-established project of Negotiating, negotiating and representing U.S. history in their games, in particular focusing on Red Dead Redemption 2010, Red Dead Redemption 2 2018, and L.A. Noir 2011. 
Uh, her work argues for the importance of studying promotional materials, developer branding strategies, and other kinds of pyrotechnical materials associated with the development and the release of historical digital games. So, Professor Esther, you've got about 20 to 30 minutes to present your speech. Perfect. Um, thank you so much. I'll just um, share, hopefully, my slides. Um, okay. Um, hopefully, that's working and everyone can see that. Great. Okay. Um, so, um, I'm really happy to be kind of speaking as part of this panel um, and this kind of really interesting central question about sort of um, video games and authenticity or entertainment. Um, and really this question is a really, um, is, has been a really sort of fundamental question, I suppose, for historical game studies about where historical games sit on this perhaps binary between entertainment and authenticity and whether or not um, these things can or can't complement each other. Um, and really, it, it doesn't have a particularly simple answer. Um, but we can attempt to sort of understand the complexity of the issues that this question presents, or maybe try and attempt to construct some answers, um, I argue, by looking beyond the traditional boundaries of games themselves. There's a lot more um, going on. There are a lot of different ways we can understand or think about this question about authenticity and entertainment. Um, and a lot more going on with the way that games engage with history um, than we can get out of just looking at the games themselves in isolation as just media representations of the past or different kinds of engagements with history. So um, as I kind of argue in my work, um, it's important to consider the discourses around historical video games, um, the kinds of things that are being said about them at the margins, by, by players, by, by kind of gaming communities, but also by game developers and the people who are actually marketing um, marketing these games and trying to sell them to, to an audience, as is, as I said, the kind of the focus of my work. So I, I look at and I argue for the importance of looking at different kinds of digital promotional materials, whether that's trailers or blogs or developer interviews um, and so on, and how these different kinds of sources are used by game marketers to perform different kinds of functions. So this could be to sort of um, to harness or attempt to shape meaning about the past that a game is going to try and offer perhaps even to weaponize or to warp public, uh, popular kind of memory of the past. And looking at these kinds of sources then can offer us insight into the status and almost the, the currency of different kinds of historical events and periods in, in a contemporary context, in a contemporary sort of media environment. Um, and in these discourses, in these online promotional discourses, the, these ideas of entertainment and authenticity are, are usually very much connected. Um, promotional materials, as I said, they they set, a, they set out to do lots of different things. They often try to teach players different things about history, as well as highlighting and, and selling and marketing um, a game's more experiential quality. So what it is the player is going to be able to do through them. So for my talk, um, I want to talk through um, some examples of historical video game promotional materials um, by focusing on a, a couple of examples of mainstream historical games from the last decade or so, maybe just over a decade. Um, and in doing so, we can see the ways um, these ideas um, about perhaps the extent to which a game is entertaining. So how a game company is trying to sell the idea that a game will provide players with an enjoyable or valuable gameplay experience um, and one that a player will hopefully also want to invest their time and money in, um, as well as a game that is how they're trying to sell the idea that a game is also historically authentic. So that is also a meaningful and kind of valuable engagement with the specific source material or historical material or period or place or event that it represents. And like I said, looking at the ways that these two different things are sort of intrinsically connected um, in different ways, though, in, in the way that specific games are marketed. Both of these sort of ideas about authenticity or entertainment, they tend to overlap and rely on each other in some interesting ways. Companies, game companies are always trying to sell an entertaining experience, um, but they are also selling, as I said, this historical experience too. And this requires them to claim or try to construct these claims that what they've done is in some way a sort of um, a meaningful or legitimate perhaps experience of, of, of a known or sometimes an unknown past. 
Um, so to do this, I first want to kind of talk through how I, I understand or some of the ways that I understand this term historical authenticity as we can apply it or as it has been applied or could be applied to historical games. Um, the way that I engage with this term authenticity um, in my work is really that it's a, a term or a label that lacks any sort of stable meaning. It's often um, considered to sort of be in the eye of the beholder um, and in playing, in, in anyone kind of playing or analysing a particular historical game, different people might come to come to sort of um, wildly different conclusions about the extent to which a game is historically authentic or it's um, the often synonymous word historically accurate. Uh, and they might come to these conclusions for different reasons, depending on who they are, whether um, they are an academic or a historian that has a specific specialty or a player or a game developer and so on. So these perceptions that a game has authentic qualities, though, they usually equate to um, a game's value as a historical game. So trying to make a player or a player communities or critics uh, re receive this idea favorably and to kind of um, come to their own conclusion that a game is authentic is something that game developers and publishers and marketers they actively want to ensure that the players actually do this that players perceive this a game as authentic and they want to then invest their time and money in the game um, so developers go to great lengths attempting to influence these perceptions and, and they do this by um, using these different kinds of promotion materials so the way that I think about authenticity is to think about it in the way that um, Richard Peterson has, has talked about an authenticity work, that authenticity is never really a, an actual property um, or quality of a product. It's authenticity is always a claim made by someone else on behalf of um, something, some product. Um, and that can be kind of perceived positively or negatively. And this is why um, if it's always something that has to be kind of um, constructed and negotiated, it's it's something that, um, as I said, developers spend a lot of time and energy trying to make somebody, uh, a potential player, believe effectively. It also works, um, authenticity also works as Rob Horning has, has kind of argued as a, as a simplifying force. Um, claiming or constructing the idea that something is authentic allows you to sort of uh, do away with the potential complexity or conflicting interpretations to offer something that is the singular authentic experience and therefore a more valuable experience and perhaps other different kinds of experiences or in this case, um, gameplay experiences that are in some way historical. So to do this often, um, as we'll see in some examples, um, the way that game developers try to construct this idea about a game being authentic um, is that they perform, they actively embody and perform the role of developer historian, which is a term that Adam Chapman um, coined in his 2016 book, Digital Games as History. And they do this, as I said, to almost occupy this pedagogical role to often give a player an insight into their interpretation of the past um, usually with the intention of them seeking these claims for authenticity so a player will um, receive their kind of uh, claims about authenticity and value positively so in terms of thinking about how this looks in in practice by talking through some examples um my my work my kind of substantive work that um i published in, in my book that, that was mentioned that came out last year it tried to understand very specifically these kinds of things these ideas about authenticity and the developer historian in the context of rockstar games as a major mainstream developer who have been really committed to making games that engage with um, us history and culture for the last two decades uh, and what i what i did was look at lots of different kinds of promotional material that rockstar created for two particular games mainly released in 2010 and 2011 and that's Red Dead Redemption and Ellie Noir. They were two games which engaged really deeply with the historical and kind of cultural imaginary of the American West in particular at two different points in the early to mid 20th century. So through the, the kinds of materials I looked at and the ones that you can see on the the right hand side of the screen um, are different materials that were published as blog posts on Rockstar's official website um, on the Rockstar Newswire space here. Um, these materials were um, explicitly staking these claims, they were constructing these claims for the authenticity of their games. They were performing this role of developer historian by talking about um, how they 
um, incorporated real historical insights into their games. They were commodifying the research they had undertaken to, to sort of in, in the development process. They were occupying this deliberately pedagogical position. They were teaching players what the history of the American West was, um, or the history of kind of post-war American society was. Um, but they, they weren't just doing this out of um, the desire to be historian. They were offering these kind of insights and offering these interpretations of the past in such a way as to make these games seem as though they best represented some sort of um, uh, all encompassing historical truths about these period, these periods rather, um, and therefore trying to guarantee that the experience that players were going to have of these periods by playing these games was both authentic and, and therefore all the more enjoyable because you would get to kind of live or see what it was like um, to supposedly be you know, in these periods of the past. They were making all these kinds of, of truth claims. Um, they were using kind of terms like real, lots of different terms that are either treated sort of synonymously with the term authenticity, um, or they were actually using the term authenticity themselves or authentic to talk about um, the, the kinds of things that they were trying to incorporate into the game, the kinds of research that they had done. They were making all these kinds of um, assurances about the validity and legitimacy of the game's historical content. So for Red Dead Redemption, for example, it was really about highlighting that there were real people in the history of the American West that were um, very similar to in kind of personality and experience to the main character of John Marston. So, even though John Marston was a fictional character, by playing through him and having his kind of gameplay experience, they were almost living something that was authentic to real people's experiences. Um, for the case of Ellie Noir, um, it was about how players, the intrinsic part of the player's experience of, of, of playing Ellie Noir was that they would get to solve real crimes that actually had sort of remained unsolved um, or partially solved in, in Los Angeles in 1947. Um, and, and in kind of building up their worlds, they really sort of um, sought to highlight all the historical detail and material culture, all the kinds of research they'd done into sort of um, proper archival work. Um, so really, it, it was about demonstrating the kind of credentials, I guess, as, as researchers into the history and historical content of these periods. But this was also really intrinsically um, related to um, the cultural history of these periods um, and actually making very explicit claims about the fact that not only was the were the games themselves going to entertain the player but also um that engaging with these kinds of promotional materials was designed um or these promotional materials were designed to entertain the player while they were waiting for the game itself to be released so rockstar released another series of blog posts in which they recommended different um, films and cultural products to players um, and, and as this quote shows, when they were sort of recommending that players watch The Wild Bunch, they were certain films or, or, or cultural texts that were designed to, to entertain players and get them in the mood to, to play the game when it was released. So in this sense, they were almost acting as well like cultural historian and trying to create this sense of legitimacy or authenticity for the game while still engaging with players um, and giving them other kinds of means to be entertained, as it were, even before they had a chance to, to play the games themselves. So these kinds of um, promotional materials were, were making very sort of um, explicit claims about historical authenticity. Um, they were sort of showing the research process. There was this active and quite direct performance of, of Rockstar as a company in the role of developer historian. Um, but there are different ways that history um, is being used in different kinds of promotional materials. And it isn't just a case of developers saying, um, here's the research that we did, this is what the game says about the past and it's authentic. It's often or has been in the past, I guess, um, more subtle and sort of nuanced than that. So we can think about this by looking at another kind of more recent example um, of the, the way that Assassin's Creed Valhalla, um, when it was first promoted by a cinematic kind of premiere trailer um, in April 2020, the way that it actually in, in more quite explicit but more subtle in some ways um, it, it engaged in these kind of discourses about historical revisionism and how Ubisoft through this trailer were quite deliberately um, showing their, their position and how they were trying to make a game that was 
historically authentic or um, you know all these kinds of buzzwords, buzzwords they might use about showing the the real history of the Vikings and they did it in some interesting ways um so I've, I've got some kind of screenshots of the way that this trailer um which you can still access it's still available on YouTube there's a, a general sort of voiceover that comes um from um, King Alfred who is talking and kind of narrating um about who the Vikings are and while these kind of words are being said and while he's kind of um signing a I guess a, a war declaration against the, the Viking raiders the the words that he's saying to describe them like that they are heartless and godless barbarians is overlaid um on images you know uh, clips of them the viking settlers behaving in antithetical ways to this so in, in this case um you see them uh, as kind of family oriented and settlement oriented and worshiping their own um kind of religion um so not being heartless godless barbarians um he says that they murder and kill blindly and in this scene you see um a viking raid but that the, the viking sort of stops his his fellow viking from murdering women and children um for example it, it moves into uh, this claim that you know the vikings scar the lands of england lands they will never defend and never love and you see them playing with their children and building settlements and kind of making a home in this kind of quite idyllic kind of english countryside before we then um, move into actual scenes where we find um, Alfred signing a kind of declaration of war against the Vikings. So for the first kind of part of this trailer, you have this very kind of explicit and deliberate messaging about how this game is going to show the other side of the Vikings, how he is going to engage in a kind of historical revisionism in a sense to show you something that popular culture doesn't also, doesn't often show you rather. But then for the majority of the trailer, um, what he actually says, what Alfred says is that the time has come to speak to them in a language they will understand. And he's talking very specifically about speaking to the Vikings by making this declaration of war and violence. But the majority of the rest of the trailer then is basically dedicated to showing the player exactly the kinds of violence that they will be able to enact, and that exactly the kind of gameplay that we or a player might expect from a kind of triple a action adventure game a game like assassin's creed that is sort of known in many ways for the sort of um heroic and powerful violence that um the player can enact um while playing the game so even within this one trailer you've got these kind of um this complimentary these complimentary i guess ideas about um the fact that they are trying to do something more authentic perhaps they're trying to do something that is meaningfully historical but they are still offering the same kind of entertainment factor the same kind of enjoyment of an assassin's creed game or the sort of enjoyment perhaps that you might um expect from an assassin's creed game in the kind of the the warfare and the violence that you'd also expect from a viking game and um, i don't entirely know whether this video is going to work but maybe you'll be able to see things moving um this is a, a trailer that was kind of released to some more social media um, and other sites celebrating um the the 15 year anniversary of assassin's creed um and it had a really interesting tagline that was kind of leap into history and it is a sort of riff off um the the general or the long-standing assassin's creed tagline which was history is our playground which is now kind of morphed into um history is everybody's playground um but again it's it's kind of putting these two ideas about historical engagement and historical authenticity and and entertainment into conversation constantly um this idea that history is the playground that by leaping into assassin's creed by engaging with these games you are it is enabling you to leap into history um that you can have as the player a kind of active engagement with with making history to be the thorn in history side um as it kind of uh, says here um so as a company that has often sought to really involve players and um sort of make these kind of um participatory narratives that ask these players to kind of get get involved um these kinds of claims and the way that this company tries to sort of um engage with their fans and to um make these certain um claims or i suppose sort of market the kind of entertainment experience they're offering it's always very intrinsically bound up with um their engagement being a very meaningful engagement with the period and the player being able to have a meaningful engagement with the historical period that they are representing 
Um, finally, there's um, a, as a much more recent example um, of, of a historical game that only came out sort of last November in 2022, um, but a really interesting game, both in terms of what it does with history, but also the way that it was um, that it was kind of marketed to to prospective players. Um, in the the kind of the, the game of Pentiment, um, it's an interesting. It makes some interesting. Um, it has some interesting ideas about the constructedness of history. That history is kind of a, a narrative that that different people sort of contribute to. This is a, a major theme of the game. Um, that any historical narrative, any historical understanding that we have in the present day is always a consequence of what we choose to remember and, and who we choose to remember. So broadly speaking, as, as a game, it's got a very strong, um, not only negotiation or representation of a very specific period, being 16th century Bavaria, but history is a theme and, and the idea of what history is and questioning what history is, is, is really important to the game more, more generally beyond just the a kind of surface level representation of a particular time and place. In the 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 marketing of the game, um, generally speaking, there were some interesting um, kind of claims being made about the fact that um, I'll just actually go back one. What the what Obsidian as the developer and the the, the small team of developers what they were trying to do really was to um, pre preserve the past or trying to preserve the past. Um, and doing and preserving perhaps the the art style of illuminated manuscripts and woodblock prints and the advent of the, the printing press in this kind of um, late medieval early modern period. So the the and you can see this actually in in this being a, a screenshot of the game that the things that happen in the game sort of take place almost on the pages of a of a manuscript in that sense that is really trying to be very authentic to a particular um, uh, style from a very particular period of the past. But the website itself, so the official website um, for the Pentiment from Obsidian, um, was really uh, took a lot of time and, and, and space to, to teach players, again, this kind of pedagogical tone, teaching players about the 16th century and the broader historical context that the game finds itself in, that it's this period rich in political and social and economic change, um, that it, there was this kind of major push in education. Um, so again, it's like staking this claim in terms of um, the meaningful and serious engagement they have made with this historical period and therefore what the game was doing with this period um, is all the more authentic for doing so. But the idea that the player is going to have a personal and sort of tailored and entertaining experience is also bound up with this, that there is a very heavy um, role-playing element to the game that you get to, as a player, choose your different academic and social background, um, that your choices, that you get to find your own way through this turbulent time and see the consequences of these choices playing out over the generations. These sorts of things are, are really important to the game. And even in this, just this one kind of small website, um, these ideas about what they've done in terms of creating a historically authentic game, but also making a game that is entertaining and personal and a good experience for players to have are, are really kind of bound up together. This is also kind of echoed through the other kinds of promotional materials um, that were released for, for the game. So a behind the scenes video um, that is directly connecting and um, wanting to make um, an interesting game, wanting to make a complex and mechanical game, the sort of games that a company like Obsidian is known for, um, focused on story and characters and you know that kind of entertainment factor for the kinds of players who want to play a very sort of story focused game. This is in, in, intrinsically bound up with the fact that, well, the best way to do this and the weirdest kind of fiction we can come up with um, is, is never going to be as good as actually making a historical game to, to engage with real historical things that have happened, real historical people um, and, and events and processes. So the to make the, the best in the perspective and Obsidian's perspective and the perspective of Josh Sawyer as game director, um, to make the most enjoyable and interesting experience for them meant doing so in a way that just engaged with history rather than making things that, you know, um, that was sort of how they saw what they wanted to try and do, I guess. And in this being such a kind of, I guess, historically minded game that was very much trying to do something meaningful, or the, the promoted in terms of how it was trying to do something meaningful with history. Um, one of the other really interesting things that they, they they used to market the game was a recommended reading list. 
um, that included lots of different examples, essentially of well-known, um, kind of quite famous actually historical um, historical novels and, and particularly micro histories. So books like The Cheese and the Worms by Carla Ginsburg or The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco or um, The Mater Return of Martin Gare by Natalie Zimmerman Davis. These well-known and traditional kind of um, legitimate works by historians um, in this sense were again offered to players be before kind of in the interim of the game coming out as if you read these kinds of things um, you will sort of these will give you a better sense of the the game and its history and you'll see that what we've done this is kind of what they're claiming you'll see that what we've done is historically authentic but also these are things that you might enjoy um, is as well. So again, like kind of like what Rockstar were doing in recommending films, they were sort of recommending books that you could go um, and, and enjoy um, as separate to the game. But it's still all kind of winding up together, these ideas of kind of entertainment, both within the game and outside the game, as well as creating the sense that what they've done was, was real research with real historical kind of tech um, and source materials to make an experience that would feel authentic. Um, and this, again, is something that comes through similar kinds of um, the wider promotional discourse for the game, which really was talking about um, the fact that what they were inviting players to do, the kind of engagement they were inviting um, from players uh, for the game was something, it was a different way of accessing history, that they were inviting audiences to examine history through something other than the lofty lens we're used to it being filtered through. That this was offering a more meaningful engagement with the past. Um, and and they, um, kind of Josh Sawyer in this interview um, for IGN in November 2022 was using this kind of Hilary Mantel quote to almost, again, perform this role of developer historian, but to, to demonstrate this almost more complex engagement with history, with the idea of what history is, um, in such a way that this game, I guess, would try to be taken seriously, that it would be interesting and enjoyable for players who wanted this kind of more story based game, but it was going to be offering something legitimately historical as well, informed by all of these real um, historical kind of uh, sources and, and texts and, and um, inspirations, I guess. So to kind of, I guess, bring that to a close, um, in, by looking at historical game promotion, we can see that there are very clear attempts being made in different ways to engage audiences, to, to make them, uh, to kind of draw them into um, a game's promotional surround, to either involve them in the kind of sense of um, constructing a game's value, um, or just to sort of entertain them, either to entertain them more widely before they come to play a game or to convince them that when they do play a game, it will be an entertaining and enjoyable experience for them. But also intrinsic to this is that these promotional materials are always trying to construct or create a sense of authenticity that they, game developers, game marketers, are hoping that players um, will in some sense come away with the perspective that what they're going to get is a historically meaningful, um, experience that um, they will kind of uh, almost believe is, is an authentic representation of something that happened um, in the past. Um, all of these things are kind of constantly in play um, and are good reasons why we should be looking beyond the kind of boundaries of just focusing on analysing the games themselves to understand um, what's being said and who is saying the kinds of things that they're saying about history, um, about the past and about our kind of gaming engagements with them around sort of the, the margins of, of the texts. Um, so yeah, that's me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Esther. Uh, thank you for our perfect speech and for your highlights. Muchas gracias por su, por su presentación y por los puntos destacados importantes. Uh, agora eu vou convidar o professor Nick Weber. Now I'd like to invite professor Nick Weber. Hello. Uh, Hi. Thank you very first, much. First of all, let me summarize your resume, and after that, I'll pass for you. Uh, professor Nick Weber is an associate professor in media at the Birmingham Center for Media and Cultural Research, Birmingham City University, UK. His research focuses on video games, cultural history, and identity, 
and his current projects explore the historical practices of player and fan communities and the concept of the culturally British video game. He holds a PhD in medieval history from the University of Birmingham. So, Professor, you've got about 20 to 30 minutes to uh, do your presentation. Feel Thank free. you very much. Just hope these slides will work for me. There we go. Great. Okay. So, um, Esther has just talked to you about uh, developers really and and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk to you a bit about players and before I start a couple of content warnings there are a few uh, expletives in this because I'm using um, player commentary and players sometimes swear um, and also it engages uh, with some themes in places of racism and misogyny um, so just kind of be prepared for that um, and hopefully it's not nothing too 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 contentious or unpleasant um, so what I'm interested in here then is I'm interested in in the idea of authenticity um, and particularly how players think about that idea and what they say about that idea um, as they engage with historical games. Um, and really what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take you through some thinking really that's still in progress for me. Um, so I'm still working out these ideas really. Um, and I'm going to take you through some material from three quite long discussion threads that test these ideas out. Um, and I'm going to focus on three historical games or games which are which are referred to in as historical games um, in in some of these player communities. So as Esther has already mentioned, this work is set in the context of a subfield of game studies, which is known as historical game studies um, or HGS. And that focuses on the connection between history and games. Uh, so what Adam Chapman and his colleagues described in 2017 is the study of games that in some way represent the past or relate to discourses about it, the potential applications of such games to different domains of activity and knowledge, and the practices, the motivations, and the interpretations of players of these games or other stakeholders involved in their production or consumption. So I'm focusing on the, the players here. This is a comparatively young field um, against the backdrop of history proper. Um, or even against game studies. The antecedents of this field are generally seen around about 2004, 2005, but it's now developed into quite a substantial discussion and is perhaps on the way to becoming a field in its own right. And certainly, and much like game studies, um, it's an intersectional field. It sits between disciplines which include, but aren't limited to, historical studies, uh, game studies, film and media studies, archaeology, cultural studies, etc. So today I'm interested in, in three key ideas, really. Firstly, as I say, I'm interested in authenticity. And as I'll explain in a moment, it's become pretty difficult to escape the discourse of authenticity in relation to historical games. Every discussion, it seems, is concerned with authenticity, and yet relatively little work has been done to unpick this concept. We talked about authenticity, but we haven't necessarily talked always about quite what authenticity means. Secondly, I'm concerned with modernity really only as a way to think in relation to and around authenticity, but it's important to mention it, as I think it's critically important to understanding the challenge that our ready acceptance of the idea of authenticity poses to our sense of history. And by our, I kind of mean historians in particular, but also more broadly scholars working in the humanities in what is a postmodern and arguably post-human context. And then finally, I'm interested in nostalgia, um, an idea that might sit in tension with authenticity, as it does according to Julia Bennett, which might in fact help us to better understand authenticity as a term used by players. This is something that's hinted at, although not really explored by Felix Zimmerman in his introduction to the recent History and Games collection edited by him and by Martin Lauber. But where I feel Felix and I diverge is that he's persuaded by arguments that claims for authenticity are wholly about responses to uncertainty. And I think I disagree with that. I think they're about comfort, so nostalgic rather than anything else. But let's see. Um, authenticity, as I kind of suggest, has been really important in the development of historical game studies as a field of scholarship, and it's also at the heart of many discussions about the ways in which games reckon with history and with the past. Uh, we see it in promotional discourses, as Esther's just told us about. Uh, we see it in player and modern discussions about the nature of the past represented in historical games, and we see it throughout the literature on historical games uh, in general. Um, and this draws heavily on conceptions of authenticity around, for example, reenactment or historical film. So places in which authenticity has been discussed prior to its discussion in relation to games. Game scholarship has considered authenticity both as a category of historical representation, but also as something that's felt. 
an indicator of player familiarity and comfort, as I say, uh, often grounded in prior experiences of particular representations of the past. So what Andrew Salvati and Jonathan Bullinger, following Hayden White, term players cultural endowment. Some historians have, however, expressed, expressed concern uh, about the use of the idea of authenticity. Ludmilla Jordanova, for example, has referred to a cult of authenticity and romanticization. And she says that authenticity is a highly problematic category in historical practice, and it is right that we offer a critique of it, and that claims to authenticity are problematic because they grant privileges on emotional grounds. The use of the term, it seems, has actually sharply increased since the 1990s, and the meaning of authenticity changes depending on its context and purpose. Um, as Christoph Klassen remarks, authenticity is a cultural construct. What's seen as authentic depends on interpretations and allocations of meaning. It's based on conventions of representation, established discourses, and also on faith in the appropriateness of images, symbols, and metaphors serving as representatives of reality. So authenticity has to be historicized and contextualized. So coming back to games, Esther talks about in, in, in her recent book um, about how claims of historical authenticity by game developers rarely indicate any significant challenge to existing monolithic histories. Here she tells us the pursuit of authenticity leads to an oversimplification of historical complexities, and while textual and paratextual content overwhelmingly privileged white masculinity, confining all others to the margins, and that latter quote comes from her PhD thesis. This use of authenticity in the context of the cultural industries here as a brand um, is an example of what Suzanne Nala and Haro Muller refer to as a global authenticity industry, a sentiment echoed by Regina Bendix, who observes that the world is saturated by things and experiences advertising their authenticity. So as Klaassen again explains further, the need for authenticity can be interpreted as a consequence of the increasing dominance of popular consumer culture and media society. Paradoxically, it's exactly this need that such a culture continually seeks to satisfy. Analysis of the global authenticity industry can most clearly be seen actually not in history, but in tourism studies particularly with reference to heritage tourism, where concerns about producing an authentic experience or creating engagement with authentic objects are really important. Historical game scholars have attempted to articulate their own explanatory frameworks or typologies of authenticity. So Salvati and Bullinger, they have this idea of selected or selective authenticity, a form of narrative license in which an interactive experience of the past blends historical representation with generic conventions and audience expectations, all within a reductive frame. And this, this interpretation is widely cited. Um, Felix Zimmerman divides authenticity into three semantic levels, object auth authenticity, so the authenticity of things, subject authenticity, so um, the authenticity of the self, and then even subjective authenticity, so the auth authenticity that you feel. However, work in tourism studies breaks this concept down even further. Um, Deepak Chahabra identifies five prominent views of authenticity in the field, which you can see on the right of the slide here, objective, constructivist, negotiated, existentialist, and theoplacity. Objective constructionist and existentialist views are most relevant to us here. So these are the authenticity of things, an authenticity influenced by capitalism and commercialism, what Gillian Rickley Boyd points out, um, justifies authenticity based on stereotypical images, expectations and cultural preferences, and an authenticity that's concerned with feelings, emotions, sensations, relationships and the self. As an idea in relation to historical games, authenticity presents another problem for us. Uh, the majority of scholarship on historical games relies on postmodernist, relativist, and post-structuralist approaches to thinking about the past, given the complicated historical representations offered by these non-linear media forms, and their necessary playfulness with historical narrative and with time. While some historians disavow postmodernist approaches to the past, the literary turn in history, the perspectives they reject are the extremes. So um, these are things like endless relativism, for example, in which no facts can be established. In practice, however, the fundamentals of postmodernist thought have actually been incorporated into basic approaches to historical scholarship, prompting greater criticality and re-evaluation of a range of what had previously been settled debates. But authenticity, as indicated by a range of literature on the concept, is actually a special concern of modernity and a defining feature of modernism. So in reflecting on this idea, it's, it's commonplace for contemporary scholars to refer to Walter Benjamin's work, in particular his well-known piece from 1935, The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. In this work, Benjamin talks about what we might call objective authenticity in terms of aura. Uh, the inherent qualities of an original thing, its uniqueness, and the inherent distance that results from its embeddedness in what he calls tradition and the ritual function. This aura is, however, stripped away during the process of reproduction, so copies lose their aura their authenticity. So authenticity here is about 
genuineness, I suppose, of objects and also of experiences. And as an aside here, but very current as I was writing this paper, my attention was drawn to a recent comment by the musician Nick Cave about people sending him songs in the style of Nick Cave written by ChatGPT. He observes in a very kind of Benjaminian manner, what ChatGPT is in this instance is replication as travesty. ChatGPT may be able to write a speech or an essay or a sermon or an obituary, but it cannot create a genuine song. It could perhaps in time create a song that is on the surface indistinguishable from an original, but it will always be a replication, a kind of burlesque. So this is a similar response to a similar kind of threat, you know, aura cannot be replicated. The relationship of authenticity and modernity is important when we think about modernity's disposition towards the past. Post-colonial writing about the European Middle Ages has demonstrated that the historical project of modernity intertwined with what was increasingly defined as a barbarous medieval period, um, sorry, intertwined what was increasingly defined as a barbarous medieval period with the contemporary situation of colonized countries and subjects underpinning European narratives of progress and preeminence. So modernity sought to retroactively distance the present from the past, the modern from the pre-modern, creating through periodization the imagined rupture of the Renaissance, which is generally now considered by historians to be something that was kind of made up. These kinds of ruptures with the past bear strongly on the relationship between what's understood as indeed what can be authentic or for that matter, nostalgic responses to insecurity in the face of a changing world. More recent interventions and understandings of authenticity seem to soften this abrupt perspective. And scholars disagree about whether in the present moment, authenticity is always about rupture and distance or whether sometimes, particularly in communities and presumably in the existential sense, it's about continuity actually. In any event, authenticity continues to make claims about connections to underlying qualities of genuineness or perhaps realness. I think Esther, Esther mentioned the kind of the, this desire for realism. And scholars continue to argue that uh, the sense in games that high difficulty settings are the authentic mode of play harkens back to the reasons for those modernist ruptures, the idea that the past was hard and bad and modernity was simply better. So authenticity provides a kind of rather complex backdrop for my investigation here. And this means that the recognition that, that it is deployed situationally and contextually is really important. I'm also interested in how players make use of authenticity. And this is, as we will see, different in some ways from the ways in which developers and academics make use of it. Um, in thinking about players and, and their uses of authenticity, I'm guided by insightful questions posed by other writers on authenticity, uh, particularly Regina Bendix, who asks, who needs authenticity and why? And how has authenticity been used? And Gillian Rickley Boyd, who asks, what does authenticity do? To explore these questions, I'm going to look at some examples from three games. Uh, Total War Rome 2, uh, which came out in 2013. Maud Howe, which came out in 2019, and Kingdom Come Deliverance, which came out in 2018. All of these games make claims to the authenticity of their representation of the past, and so are good objects of study to interrogate player reception of such claims. However, and before I do, there's something I need to talk about, which you're, if you're familiar with discussions of player discourses around history, you'll realize hasn't yet been mentioned, the idea of accuracy, which again, Esther talked about. At Historical Games Network, we've joked about accuracy versus authenticity being the, the kind of the historical game studies equivalent of narratology versus ludology in broader game studies. If you don't know what this is about, it's worth a Google search, but ignore Espen Arseth's article telling you that it didn't happen because there was very much a debate around this. Certainly in every player discussion of authenticity, accuracy is a key term at play. And while as historians, we might see the two ideas as closely related, although we've long since resolved the distinctions between them. For both players and developers, an ambiguity between the two ideas often remains. Uh, James Sweeting argues that we increasingly see the two things as significantly different, as separate designations, rather than, as he puts it, two sides of the same coin. But in practice, this isn't always true for players and nor arguably for game developers. As Andrew Wackerfuss notes, it seems audiences remain hungry for accuracy-based authenticity, and almost half of the Assassin's Creed players surveyed by Jacqueline Burgess and Christian Jones thought accuracy and authenticity were the same thing. Drawing on their findings, Burgess and Jones suggest that developer claims to authenticity um, are understood by players to imply greater historical fidelity than the developers intend. Um, and with this in mind, they go on to define authenticity as when the overall appearance and significant details of the depiction of a historical context are historically accurate and thus align with the historical records and facts. Just show you the slide as well. Um, 
However, historical authenticity does allow for some artistic license in the form of speculation, changes, or additions that are still grounded in the historically accurate record to present an accessible narrative. This is my emphasis here because I'm just drawing out these kind of connections through to accuracy. So this kind of authenticity can be seen across historical game studies literature and will inform my analysis, although I note that previous studies of players haven't always been conclusive on this overlap. For example, Tara Copleston's work doesn't necessarily highlight this. Um, and Assassin's Creed players are overrepresented in the literature. A lot of people talk about Assassin's Creed players. In any case, there are intimations that players aren't using authenticity with the same meaning as developers, and probably not in the range of nuanced ways uh, offered by the theorization of the term in tourism studies. Certainly, the use of authenticity occurs alongside accuracy, and as Burgess and Jones suggest, in some instances, interchangeably in a way which causes some frustration, um, as you can see here. Um, if I had a euro every time people mixed up historical accuracy with historical authenticity, I'd have enough to play this game at 2K, high resolution, with 120 frames per second. So according to Tara Copleston's research, player interpretations of accuracy are typically linked to what they've read or seen in books or what they were taught at school. This form of historical knowledge, while drawing on a limited basis, is broadly what we might expect accuracy to mean, verifiable by some kind of authoritative resource, albeit with that resource being beyond critical assessment, and encountered at a specific moment in time, often within the ideological structure of an education system. So it's here that authenticity potentially becomes interesting. If accuracy covers the faithfulness of games to known history, why do players need authenticity? How do they use it? And what does it mean for them? So looking across the three games I want to explore, I'll start by saying that uses of authenticity uh, aren't always part of heated debates. For example, one Mordhau player posting on Steam asked whether or not it's possible to create authentic Lanzanect armor. A kind of simple question about what's possible within the game. Elsewhere, a Kingdom Come Deliverance player describes the game as authentically boring, and, and that might be contentious in the community, I admit, but it's certainly not the kinds of discussions I'm looking at here. Um, it's certainly a different meaning of authenticity anyway. In, in any case, many appearances are seen in the context of, of really quite long discussion threads, often arguments about the representation of the past that these games offer. And discussions of authenticity, normally alongside accuracy, can become notably visible at moments when game makers discuss the representation or remission of groups commonly marginalized in historical work, such as women and people of color. These discussions are trigger points which draw out accuracy versus authenticity debates. Discussions around my sample games help to shed some light on how authenticity is deployed. So firstly, here, the matter of women generals in Total War Rome 2, a moment of dispute that's been discussed by Jane Draycott in her recent edited collection on women in historical and archaeological video games. It resulted from a perceived change in the spawn rate of female generals following a 2018 update, leading to extensive debate about whether this was accurate. And then, after an intervention by a representative of game developer Creative Assembly, a discussion about authenticity. So as you can see here, Total War games are historically authentic, not historically accurate. If having female units upsets you that much, you can either mod them out or just not play. People saying they won't buy the game because there are too many women in it is fine with us. If that's their reason, we'd rather they didn't anyway. Now this kind of defensive comment about authenticity from developers isn't unusual, not only to turn a discussion away from issues of accuracy, but also to reject censorship. Um, for example, asking to be judged on the authenticity, the accuracy and the tone of their content. Um, rather than a political message, for example. Following Ella's comment, uh, there was an extensive and quite nuanced disagreement about the meaning of authenticity. As with Burgess and Jones' Assassin's Creed players, some players felt that accuracy and authenticity were functionally the same thing, as you can see in the first comment here. Historical or authentic authenticity is the same as historically accurate. Look it up. One player, uh, represented in the other three comments, embarked on a journey of discovery, attesting to the value of games in provoking historical discussion, taking issue with historically authentic and not historically accurate. It's either history or fantasy, or historical or fantasy. And noting that while some players may choose not to follow the historical path, that is not what we're talking about. There is, he tells us, she tells us, no difference between authenticity, which this player refers to as genuine, and accuracy, which they refer to as exactly to the history, these are just words to confuse people. And even if there is a difference, and apparently there is a slight one, it still puts women on the back foot in both historical situations. Other players rejected authenticity as inaccurate or superficial, referring to it as a buzzword used by Creative Assembly to allow for historical fantasy, which did no favors to women. 
as a blunt rather than a nuanced recognition of women's roles, or as something allowing interpantheon conflict uh, here, I think, between uh, Odin and Zeus, um, as long as everyone is wearing the correct clothes. Some players saw authenticity as something more subtle and specific, though, historically flavoured, but with whatever leeway they want to make the game more appealing. And certainly not the buzzword, but the thing that freed you from the constraints of accuracy while still providing for Romans in Rome and not on the moon. Now, there are already some clear differences in usage here between the players that I'm looking at. And these become more apparent as we look at other games. Ella's observation, so that's the Creative, Assembly's rep creative Assembly representative, um, Ella's observation that players can just mod out the models that offend them is echoed for Mordhau, where the game company instead proposed a toggle that would allow people to turn diverse models off. Much of the discourse here seems similar to Total War Rome 2. Having female avatars in Mordhau is portrayed by some, of the some as the opposite of a realistic and historically authentic game, unlike in Overwatch or Fortnite, where it's more acceptable. There is a balance, one player says, between realism and fun to be struck, which is apparently an exclusionary balance by the sense of it. Non-white avatars are also not authentic in a medieval setting in Europe, like Mordhau, apparently. Now, this was a position that was actually mocked by other players who were very sarcastic about it, as you can see in the in the first quote here. I won't read it out because that does have expletives in it. Um, and there is also some thoughtfulness about what authenticity might mean in respect of the audience. Maybe we shouldn't use the audience's incorrect beliefs to shortcut narrative points. And of course, there's a value to representation. As I previously stated, says this player, I see no issue with including people that look like your audience, regardless of whether that's authentic to your setting. However, this time, there's an interesting rejoinder, an interesting kicker to this discussion, because Mordhau is not, in fact, a historically accurate or authentic game, and nowhere does the marketing for, its, marketing for it say so. So it doesn't pretend to be accurate or authentic. It doesn't claim to be accurate authentic or authentic. So what's happening here? One commentator suggests quite forcefully that it's not about history, as is demonstrated in the bottom right-hand quote. No one is legitimately upset at varied skin tones and sexes because of their immersion. I can almost guarantee you that. So maybe authenticity isn't straightforwardly about history here. Maybe something else is going on. So for my third example, uh, Kingdom Come Deliverance, really the entire game was the contentious moment here. It was slated for its whiteness and broad brush dismissal of women's agency even before it was released. Here I've chosen to focus on the hundreds of comments posted on a single review on major gaming site Rock Paper Shotgun. The game's developer uses examples of historical accuracy as a selling point for the game. And this review argues that the attempts to make the game historically accurate were a fool's errand, uh, resulting in an active debate in the comments. Once again, then, these quotes add nuance to our discussion and set forth further ideas about authenticity. Alongside the usual authenticity as accuracy, with the game seen as an excuse me, inaccurate picture of the structure and culture of bohemian society during the time period and incredibly inauthentic, authenticity is also understood as the opposite, an act of liberty with the source material. It was also simply a flavour, according to one player, something impossible, according to another player who was particularly confusing, actually, um, in their comment, or something at which the game was very successful. And, and that last comment was, was actually written by a self-proclaimed historian, someone with a degree in history. But perhaps more importantly, authenticity was also once again seen as ideological. It's also notable that there is a critique of the inconsistency of the reviewer's argument. We don't know exactly what constituted life in Bohemian society during the time period, but that he knows it wasn't like this in the game. So the question here really is, is how can we make claims about a diverse or non-diverse past if we don't really know what happened? But also, and I think this is the most interesting thing in the light of what we've seen so far, authenticity is dis understood as about vision and about reimagining. And there's this lovely quote at the end here, um, including the great idea that for players, authenticity is about making the history a part of their story rather than making them part of history's story. And again, that's somebody else who talks about their background as a historian. So what can we understand from these player quotes, these player responses? We can see how different players and their perspectives draw on authenticity and use it in different ways to make arguments, answering in basic terms the questions of how authenticity has been used and what it's doing here. And evidently, we have to reconsider the player-driven definition of authenticity advanced by Burgess and Jones, because authenticity is pretty clearly not grounded in the historically accurate record in all cases. 
However, I want to go a bit further and question how useful authenticity is here as an analytical concept. As Esther indicates, authenticity is accepted as being about something perceived. That authenticity is allocated to game environments based on a player's sense that, it, that they are in some way accurate or truthful, or actually, as we see in these quotes, realistic. But this sense of realism is extremely contingent on player knowledge about the thing being represented. And as we've also seen, this is wildly variable. Nevertheless, this is an underlying appeal to a truth, um, albeit an intensely subjective truth. So returning to the idea of modernism, this association of authenticity with reality or genuineness, the unfaked, the original, compounds the problem. The authentic is in itself a warrant of truth. Yet postmodernist thought, as I've indicated, the heart of historical analysis around games is entirely comfortable with the inauthentic as concepts such as hyperreality and the simulacrum demonstrate. It might also be noteworthy that the increasing use of the term in the 1990s and onwards suggests that this might be linked to the mainstreaming of postmodernist ideas in a public context. Uh, somebody remarked to me the other day, this is when postmodernism became culture. The idea of the subjective nature of authenticity fits better with this comfort than the sense that authenticity is a fundamental erratic quality, but it still represents some kind of attempt to link a perception to reality. For the historiographer Michael Bentley, the concept of imagination is critically important here. Authenticity distinguishes what's in keeping, so appropriate or fitting, from what is not in an imagined temporal world. Authenticity for Bentley is about verisimilitude rather than veritas. And what we know, or I would argue what we believe, about the past constrains the space of the authentic. It limits the bounds of our imagination. However, and as is evident from these player discussions, players often don't really mean this either. They're happy to argue about authenticity of representation while ignoring authenticity of practice or process or vice versa. Theirs is not a historian's authenticity in every instance, even though some players declare themselves as historians when making their arguments, as I've already suggested. This is also neither an authenticity of um, experience because this is not grounded in genuine experience, nor is it an authenticity which is fully constructed as it appears to reject stereotypes, even when they are constructed specifically with these players in mind. So who needs authenticity and why? Players evidently need the term whether they employ it critically, defensively or otherwise. But I wonder if researchers need it in quite the same way, to quite the same extent. I wonder if authenticity is perhaps the wrong term to use in these analyses when the concept of nostalgia is right there for us. The question I suppose is whether these players faced with postmodern culture and contemporary uncertainty are simply longing for something real, which authenticity purports to offer, or something else. Similar to authenticity, nostalgia is an act of imagination. It's often thought of as a longing for a past that never was, a rose-tinted view on historical experience which recasts it in light of present needs. We might think of some of these player responses as not about authenticity then, but about anomoya, a particular form of nostalgia for a time one has never known. Such an uncritical and generous view of the past, and particularly of the distant past, lies at the heart of Victorian era, era medievalism. Um, a claimed remembrance of rural idyll and pre-industrial simplicity that set aside the particular challenges and horrors of pre-modern life in a way which cut against the prevailing wisdom that historical periods and thus colonized peoples were simply an earlier stage on the road to a contemporary enlightened society. So this is a longing for a past which is less challenging than the present. And in the case of many of these players, less challenging to their senses of themselves and their knowledge of the world. Ironically, this is also likely to be a past represented uncritically and poorly in previous games they've played. Something Esther has talked about um, in, in her earlier work. If we consider player opposition to more inclusive representation, for example, and indeed to a changing player community in terms of nostalgia, we might more readily understand both the oppositional them and us sense of identity they perform and their rejection of that community as a new and natural and inauthentic community, both of which emerge from a particular form of historical disconnection. After all, nostalgia is even more about rupture and distance from the real past than authenticity is. So I'm not sure whether we need a more considered approach to authenticity following tourism studies with more care and detail taken in how we work through it as an analytical concept, or whether we need to recognize that authenticity is not what is in fact under discussion. But a straightforward deployment, deployment of authenticity seems to me to be out of keeping, inauthentic, shall we say, within a postmodern historical framework. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Professor Nick, uh, for your speech. Muchas gracias por, su, uh, por sus puntos destacados. Now, I'd like to invite Professor 
Ruth Contreras. Me gostaria de invitar a professora Ruth Contreras. Olá, bem-vinda. Bom, bueno, a professora Ruth Contreras é doutora por la Universidade Politécnica de Catalunha, professora em la Universidade Central de Catalunha, uma universidade privada com sede em Barcelona. Também ensina classes de usabilidade de jogos em la Escola de Novas Tecnologias Interativas, é cofundadora e coordenadora do Observatório de Comunicação, Videojuegos e Entretenimento da Universidade Autônoma de Barcelona, um grupo de investigação multidisciplinar constituído formalmente em abril de 2014. É elaborado com organizações internacionais em uma grande variedade de projetos, como evaluador externo em uma agência portuguesa de avaliação e acreditação, ou como membro do Conselho Científico Assessor do Simpósio Brasileiro de Juegos de Ordenador e entretenimento digital. Também se ha impartido classes na Universidade de Guadalajara, na Universidade Politécnica de Catalunha e na Universidade del Azuay. Muito bem, professora, tem cerca de 20, 30 minutos para fazer sua apresentação. De acordo, graças. Me podem dizer se se está vendo corretamente? Sim, sí, estamos ouvindo, ouvindo tranquilo. Y se escucha también correcto, ¿no? Gracias. Bien, pues eh, gracias a los organizadores por invitarme a participar eh, en esta mesa en el Congreso y voy a hablar sobre aprendizaje del patrimonio cultural eh, mediante juegos serios. Bien, pues mmm, básicamente es un tema en el que cada vez más eh, hay más investigaciones, hay más instituciones que están eh, interesados precisamente porque ha habido una reforma curricular, eh, sobre todo a nivel europeo, que ha modificado muchos planes y muchos programas de estudio. Entonces, en este panorama, los juegos serios eh, tienen la posibilidad de mostrar um, su potencial. Eh, hay un amplio interés eh, sobre, en específico como herramientas educativas eh, y en las cuales pues, permiten eh, desarrollar varios desafíos, la creación de diversos entornos, pensado en una amplia gama de, de estudios. Y la característica eh, principal en este caso es que hay muchos de estos juegos que nos permiten mostrar eh, un patrimonio cultural y acercarse de alguna manera a, a la historia. Eh, pero eh, podemos ver que a pesar de que hay, hay muchos eh, estudios que hablan de todo esto, eh, y es algo que a nosotros nos interesa porque nosotros somos dedicado muchos años al tema del desarrollo de videojuegos, eh, hemos visto que ha habido pues, eh, un, los resultados muchas veces en cuanto al aprendizaje, a la interacción, hay mucha información sobre esto, pero sin embargo todavía hacen falta más propuestas en cuanto a investigación, en cuanto al diseño de juegos que eh, nos ayuden a mostrar eh, el patrimonio cultural. Y eh, creo que es un tema o es un concepto bastante conocido por todos lo que son los juegos serios, pero haré rápidamente una definición eh, basándome en lo que dice eh, la literatura, eh, es decir, hay juegos que tienen que son una, tienen una finalidad educativa explícita, que tienen eh, o se utilizan con fines más allá del entretenimiento y eh, los cuales pues normalmente están incorporados en la formación o en la educación. Es decir, en estas tres definiciones vemos que eh, pues lo que se intenta es eh, desarrollar actitudes positivas hacia los contenidos que están dentro de, de los juegos eh, y esto de alguna manera pues, puede permitir desarrollar incluso competencias educativas dentro de, de las aulas. Eh, en este sentido... Eh, me gustaría destacar que actualmente muchas propuestas educativas eh, se enmarcan en las competencias, eh, competencias eh, educacionales, debido a que esto es algo que se rige en una buena parte de todo lo que son los sistemas educativos. En el caso de, de la Unión Europea, pues ya estableció o se ha establecido una serie de recomendaciones que determinan marcos eh, de referencia de competencias generales que son de carácter transversal y que eh, se utilizan para que cualquier estudiante eh, eh, se tenga claro lo que debe lograr. 
Estas recomendaciones hacen énfasis en todo lo que es un carácter progresivo del aprendizaje a lo largo de la vida y en contextos abiertos eh, y múltiples. Y la mayoría de, de lo que son juegos serios es que están utilizando historia, eh, en este caso historia con, con elementos auténticos, intentan crear representaciones para los jugadores, aunque eh, también incluyen mm, elementos eh, ficticios. Eh, a pesar de, de varias eh, investigaciones y marcos que, que existen en la literatura científica para diseñar juegos serios, existe muy poca orientación o muy pocas bases en cuanto a cómo tendría que ser el diseño de un juego eh, que incluya un conjunto determinado de objetivos de aprendizaje, pero incluso que, tomar, que tome en cuenta toda la parte del patrimonio. Eh, nosotros hemos, como comentaba eh, antes, eh, realizado diferentes estudios, como se pueden ver a, algunos aquí, relacionados con el diseño en concreto de, de juegos serios para mostrar contenidos educativos, eh, algunos de ellos para mostrar algunos contenidos con eh, temática histórica y basándonos en, en un marco conceptual que es el eh, Yusop, que es el primer eh, autor que vemos aquí, eh, nos ha ayudado a crear un modelo que nos ayuda a diseñar y evaluar críticamente contenido patrimonial eh, y evaluarlo eh, sobre todo eh, tomando en cuenta las competencias de aprendizaje asociadas y las formas en que estos resultados eh, pueden manifestarse dentro de, de un juego serio. Voy a definirlos, en este caso cuando hablamos de habilidades, eh, en este marco nosotros tomamos en cuenta que se debe representar habilidades que pueden desarrollarse dentro del juego, es decir, que las va a obtener el jugador cuando está jugando. Y las categorías, como pueden ver, se dividen en cognitivas, en afectivas, en psicomotoras, en la creación de un significado debido a, a la adopción que va obteniendo el jugador conforme va jugando de diferentes contenidos eh, dentro eh, de lo que sería la parte de, de patrimonio. En, en la parte de, de patrimonio, este elemento se representa en concreto eh, con dimensiones que hemos denominado patrimonial eh, e histórico, pero dentro de estas mismas patrimonial e histórico eh, puede haber tangible e intangible y la parte de eh, natural y analítico. Es decir, la información patrimonial en un juego se refiere a todo aquello que existió, mientras que la información histórica se refiere a todo aquello que sucedió. Eh, por lo tanto, eh, en, en este sentido, el patrimonio tangible se refiere a artefactos físicos, como pueden ser algunos edificios con algún eh, eh, valor cultural. El patrimonio intangible se refiere a artículos no físicos, como puede ser el idioma, las ceremonias, eh, costumbres, creencias. Eh, mientras que el patrimonio natural se refiere, pues, por ejemplo, a paisajes naturales, a la flora, a la fauna... Eh, en, en este sentido. Bien, eh, también eh, mientras que el histórico intangible puede representar cómo las personas reaccionan o se vieron afectadas por ciertos eventos eh, eh, y procesos, eh, el histórico natural eh, en este sentido se refiere a los eventos y procesos históricos asociados con un patrimonio cultural eh, en concreto. Bien, en estas dimensiones, para que se centren en la información dada por el, por el jugador, básicamente, eh, como decía, y eh, para que veamos mejor con un ejemplo, eh, lo voy a poner eh, directamente con este juego, que, para ver cómo estas dimensiones se centran en esa información eh, que se puede ir obteniendo. Eh, aquí vamos a ver en este juego directamente, eh, que se desarrolla en 1715 cuando los piratas establecen una república sin ley en el Caribe y dominaron la tierra y el mar, pues paralizando todo lo que son barcos, ¿no? navíos, interrumpiendo comercio internacional, poniendo en peligro estructuras de poder. Aquí el jugador puede seleccionar y luchar con ellas, eh, con, con ciertas, eh, el juego, perdón, se presentan diferentes armas, en concreto espadas, como se puede ver aquí en la, en la imagen, 
Eh, sin embargo, en este caso, pues son espadas históricamente precisas, pero el jugador cuando las selecciona y lucha con ellas, aquí lo que vemos como valor patrimonial no está en la fabricación, la estética o el significado de los objetos. Estos aspectos pueden ser más bien de interés para un museo. La información presentada en, en estos objetos dentro del juego son características más bien relacionadas con lo que puede ser la velocidad, con lo que puede ser el daño, que son valores utilizados para las mecánicas de un juego con espadas que no tienen un análogo eh, histórico directo. Es aquí donde, donde hablaba yo del tema de, de la ficción. En cuanto a dentro de este, eh, este marco que usamos, nosotros utilizamos también los medios de manifestación que se pueden llegar a dar en los juegos eh, relacionados con patrimonio, es decir, puede haber medios de manifestación verbal en el cual la información pues, se manifiesta a través de texto o de audio o una combinación de ambas y se encuentra comúnmente también en cuadros de información dentro de la interfaz del juego o mediante el discurso de los personajes o incluso en una voz eh, en off. La parte mm, gráfica es información patrimonial que se puede llegar a manifestar a través de medios visuales, ya sea con el uso de fotografías, ilustraciones, infografías, gráficos en 2D o en 3D y pueden ser eh, estáticos o animados. Este es el medio de manifestación eh, que consideramos que es el más utilizado para transmitir sobre todo grandes cantidades de información, eh, pero el, en este caso el contenido gráfico pues, puede ser el que requiere más recursos para crearlo, especialmente si se está haciendo recreaciones en 3D, porque, y sobre todo si son precisas de artefactos o de sitios históricos, porque requieren de mucho, o muchos recursos. Eh, la parte de audio, eh, la información del patrimonio que se puede llegar a manifestar en un juego es a través eh, de sonido o música que eh, de alguna manera se va a utilizar o se utiliza en el juego para poder desempeñar un papel importante que va a ayudar a mostrar el contexto, el contexto histórico, a, a poder mostrar eh, cómo puede incluso mejorar la experiencia de, de, del, del jugador. Eh, Finalmente, la parte de, de mecánicas es eh, información que se manifiesta a través de aquellas acciones que tiene que realizar el jugador en el juego, las interacciones con, el, con otros jugadores. Y aquí es mm, relevante cómo las mecánicas transfieren información a través de las, de las reglas o de los objetivos que se dan en los juegos. Por ejemplo, el jugador no puede avanzar si no... Eh, lee un texto histórico o que, o que presenta algún proceso histórico o no puede avanzar si no tiene un vídeo. Este sería un ejemplo. Y finalmente dentro de este espacio ponemos eh, el nivel que ponemos aquí como demostración histórica en el cual eh, lo que hacemos es el énfasis en que todo lo que hay eh, dentro de esta parte eh, verbal, gráfica, audio, mecánica son esas manifestaciones que se presentan de manera demostrativa o literal o a veces pueden ser abstractas o metafóricas. Las mm, razones de esta distinción se deben principalmente al enfoque en el contenido patrimonial. Si los procesos históricos se centran en el lugar eh, de los efectos de los actores individuales, pues pueden tener sentido desde una perspectiva del diseño del juego. Es decir, eh, se reduce la cantidad de información que se presenta al jugador mediante lo que puede ser una abstracción eh, del estilo de presentación y la manifestación abstracta pues, puede ser un método más efectivo para presentar temas eh, como pueden ser eh, la guerra, porque eso es un contenido violento eh, o que es inapropiado para ciertos tipos de jugadores, por ejemplo, los jugadores eh, más jóvenes. Finalmente, nuestro modelo tomamos en cuenta, como he dicho, ya que estamos hablando de juegos serios y los juegos serios están relacionados con educación, eh, todo aquello que es eh, una combinación de conocimientos, capacidades, actitudes adecuadas a, al contexto eh, y que son necesarias para el currículo educativo en un en una aula. Bien, voy a eh, explicar en un ejemplo de uno de los juegos que hemos diseñado eh, cómo encaja este modelo 
eh, lo explicaré en un, en un juego eh, concreto que es, eh, se llama Ferran Alcina, eh, pero el modelo se aplica a cualquiera de los 10 juegos que hemos diseñado. Estos juegos eh, que hemos eh, diseñado con financiación del gobierno de, de Cataluña en, en España está destinado a niños de primaria de 8 a 11 años eh, y el juego, en este caso, el concreto, el que Ferran Alcina, eh, tiene un, eh, como eje principal dar a conocer a un personaje de la historia de Cataluña, un técnico de la industria textil, por ello se sitúa el jugador en el proceso de la industrialización. Eh, Cataluña es una provincia al noreste de España, para quien no lo conozca. El, el jugador eh, que que utiliza normalmente un avatar, que es el niño que vemos a un lado, que se llama Yuk, para poder explorar los diversos niveles del juego. Y el robot que vemos arriba eh, es un robot que le acompañará durante el juego. En este sentido, aquí con lo que estamos jugando con ese tema de la ficción en este juego ha sido precisamente con el robot y con eh, el niño. Ahora es explicaré un poco más cuando explique los niveles del juego. En este sentido, eh, en, históricamente, Ferran Alcina, eh, además de ser un economista, dirigió una de las eh, fábricas más, más importantes o más antiguas que se conservan en Barcelona. Se le atribuye el diseño de una fábrica textil y también participó de eh, la creación de cooperativas. A nivel político, además, fue uno, un fundador eh, importante eh, de una liga y un firme defensor del proteccionismo en lo que es la economía catalana. También eh, formó parte de, de, digamos, de un gabinete de física eh, en el que actualmente todas las piezas que se, reun, se reunieron en ese momento, en este gabinete, en 1907, eh, están dentro de un museo de la ciencia y la técnica eh, en una ciudad cercana a Barcelona. Y, eh, pues, finalmente... Eh, cuando él murió en 1908, un año después, legó la finca y toda la colección de instrumentos al Ayuntamiento de Barcelona. Bien, eh, nosotros, por tanto, en este contexto que he explicado, eh, nos centramos, o este juego en concreto, se, eh, la mayoría de las, eh, de los, del contexto está ubicado en esa fábrica, eh, que está catalogada como un bien cultural de interés nacional, durante la Revolución Industrial, fue una de esas principales fábricas que se instalaron eh, alrededor de Barcelona, y eh, esta fábrica en concreto, llamada El Vapor Bell, fue la primera fábrica moderna que se instaló en los municipios más eh, industrializados. Eh, nosotros para, claro, el, o sea, estamos hablando de juegos serios, por tanto también tiene que haber entretenimiento dentro del juego, no puede ser dedicarse única y exclusivamente a dar información histórica, el juego sigue una estructura de lo que son juegos de plataformas, en este caso pues sería como un Super Mario para quien no esté familiarizado con el género de plataformas, ya que contribuyen al desarrollo psicomotor, la orientación espacial, la dirección y focalización de la atención, eh, y el jugador va a recibir ayuda constante mediante texto. Aquí, como se puede ver, el, el avatar va a estar siempre utilizando al niño y el robot le acompaña y va a ir recibiendo esa, esa ayuda mediante audio, mediante texto, mediante imágenes, que muestran eh, diferentes eh, acciones que tiene que realizar. En este juego en concreto, creamos 14 niveles con actividades que conforman toda la narración del juego. Eh, aquí se muestran los niveles, cada uno trata un tema en concreto relacionado con la vida del de personaje Ferran Alcina y su entorno histórico vivido durante la industrialización. Los primeros niveles que como ven aquí, eh, él habla de el futuro, eh, el año 3550, es esa parte ficticia que se ha añadido para dar eh, más eh, diversión al jugador, para precisamente se busca también que aprenda, pero al mismo tiempo que se entretenga. Eh, en este sentido, aquí es el primer nivel en el que accede el jugador eh, al juego, y desde aquí pues puede empezar a entender qué, qué está pasando en concreto, Aquí eh, conocerá eh, un, un poco sobre la vida de esta persona, pero realmente lo que se le explica 
es que va a retroceder en el tiempo para ir conociendo cada una de esas etapas, de esos momentos eh, que ha ido viviendo eh, Ferran Alcina. Eh, usamos en los niveles de eh, información de fuentes históricas confiables, dando una imagen del pasado, eh, quiénes estuvieron involucrados, en qué eh, situaciones, dónde ocurrió, pero en este sentido con el, el, el primer nivel que habla del futuro, hablamos con elementos imaginativos. También pues, se puede ver que eh, los años no, no son, eh, algunos hay un salto, por ejemplo, del, del 1912, que es en el nivel 10, se regresa después al año 1811 porque se juega con esta ficción de que puede ir viajando el jugador en el tiempo. Bien, todo inicia cuando el jugador accede al juego, eh, con estos personajes que son del futuro, hacen esa regresión en el tiempo, y una vez que están eh, situados en ese futuro, eh, perdón, una vez que están en, en el, aquí, desde aquí del futuro, van a hacer esa regresión al siglo XIX para poder explorar eh, todo lo que ocurre en, en el año 1889, que este sería el segundo nivel eh, que permite al avatar descubrir las diferentes eh, características de, de la fábrica eh, que dirigió este industrial en este tercer nivel. Aquí, pues, eh, como se puede ver esta información, eh, que está muy relacionada con eh, lo que, en dónde está ese contexto histórico, dónde está ese lugar, eh, también se proporciona eh, en algunas fichas didácticas del juego en cada nivel, eh, uno contenidos que dan una información aún extra histórica sobre algunos objetos o personas o, o lugares. El juego además proporciona una guía didáctica para el alumno y el profesor, eh, para, eh, sobre todo eh, en el caso de los estudiantes, pues amplía esa información sobre el contexto histórico los inicios de la industrialización y para los profesores pues damos otro tipo de material como puede ser eh, test para evaluar los conocimientos. Para el concreto, eh, para el ejemplo en concreto voy a usar el, el nivel 7 que es la mina 1912 en el cual eh, aquí eh, se verá directamente cómo era trabajar en una mina de carbón en Cataluña y se descubre todo lo que es la actividad de primera mano eh, en la industria minera. Por tanto, aquí vamos a ver estas habilidades que decía en este nivel en concreto, eh, qué habilidades se desarrollan en este nivel. En eh, cuanto a contenidos de patrimonio, eh, hablamos de un patrimonio intangible, como puede ser el idioma o las costumbres de los trabajadores en ese momento histórico. Eh, la parte del patrimonio histórico tangible, que es decir, todos esos procesos y actividades llevadas a cabo en 1912, el patrimonio intangible es cómo esas personas se vieron afectadas en la mina y en general en la industria minera. ¿Qué es lo que se utiliza en concreto en este nivel? Pues medios de manifestación como textos, gráficos en 2D, audios, sonido, música, mecánicas, que en este caso es que el jugador tiene el papel del personaje, que es el niño, para resolver ciertos acertijos que van a ir desarrollando toda la narrativa y descubriendo contenido eh, que está relacionado eh, con temas eh, históricos. En cuanto al nivel de demostración histórica, hay demostrativa y literal, en, eh, sobre todo en la parte de las fichas didácticas del juego, pero también utilizamos contenido que es abstracto y metafórico en eh, algunos de los niveles. Eh, como eh, elementos o competencias de aprendizaje que se trabajan en concreto en este nivel, eh, hay varias competencias, no voy a leerlas todas porque me queda poco tiempo, pero sí que me centraré en las que están más centradas en tema eh, cultural e histórico, que sería el caso de eh, las competencias de aprendizajes básicas. En este caso aquí eh, se habla de competencia comunicativa, en el cual hay información histórica y geográfica, eh, competencia cultural, que son aspectos históricos que el jugador debe comprender y valorar con manifestaciones culturales e históricas, 
Y en cuanto a lo que son eh, las competencias personales directas en el currículo del departamento de enseñanza, conocer un medio histórico vivido por un personaje en concreto, que en este caso es Ferran Alcina, conocer sus aspectos más relevantes de la vida en el siglo XX, eh, la revolución industrial en concreto, y los conflictos y avances que hubieron en ese momento, y eh, finalmente situar etapas y hechos de la historia catalana con una estructura cronológica. Además, eh, y aquí que también tiene mucha relación con, con algo que es el patrimonio, es decir, el idioma catalán, porque se fomenta todo lo que es eh, el uso de ese eh, idioma. Bien, ya como conclusión y para acabar mi presentación, eh, nosotros lo que hemos estado haciendo a través de, de estas eh, diferentes investigaciones es intentar utilizar eh, diferente contenido patrimonial en juegos serios, eh, pero sin olvidar que los juegos finalmente tienen una parte de entretenimiento, es decir, además de tener contenidos de aprendizaje que están predefinidos y que pueden ser utilizados en currículos, en el currículo de enseñanza, eh, también añadimos algunos pequeños eh, detalles ficticios para poder permitir que haya ese entretenimiento. Y nosotros eh, hemos planteado este modelo básicamente para que profesores o diseñadores que deseen utilizar juegos de entretenimiento o que quieran analizar juegos en los cuales se presenten algunos contenidos eh, históricos de, puedan ser eh, conscientes eh, de que los contenidos patrimoniales o históricos que se quieren incluir en un juego eh, tienen que estar eh, marcados claramente eh, y que ese contenido tiene que marcar el tipo de enfoque, es decir, es, es posible que el jugador no tenga forma de saber qué contenido es históricamente valioso y cuál no lo es y por tanto esto tiene que quedar eh, claro dentro de, de un juego serio, sobre todo si eh, está relacionado con competencias específicas de un currículum escolar. Y eh, obrigada y para cualquier pregunta... Eh, Estoy a disposición y si no, tienen aquí también mis, mis redes sociales. Muchas gracias, profesora Ruth. Uh, Muy bien, entonces ahora nos finalizamos con las presentaciones de ellos. Vamos a abrir ahora para un momento de debate. Now we are going to open up for some questions. Uh, I'd like to invite Professor Jorge, if you have anything to say, or Professor Cristiano. Professor Cristiano, você poderia entrar? É, acho que você teria uma pergunta. É, olá, boa tarde, tudo bem? É, conforme a gente combinou, o professor Jorge, ele pediu para eu elaborar uma pergunta para cada palestrante. Então, para quem entrou depois, eu sou o professor Cristiano, da Universidade Federal Fluminense. Minha dissertação de mestrado e tese de doutorado for, foram sobre história e videogames, eu analisei a Segunda Guerra Mundial. É, Guerra Fria, Guerra ao Terror. Eu sou professor de, história, de ensino de história, né, especificamente. E eu coordeno um laboratório que atualmente está em parceria com o Mitex, que é o GAME, Grupo de Análise de Metodologia e Meios de, é, Digitais para Educação. Vamos lá. Para a professora Esther White, Wright, é, sobre Red Dead Redemption, e a abordagem em torno do American History e a true, o True West, né, o verdadeiro West, me lembrou bastante a obra do Richard Slotkin, Nation Gunfighter, é, o mito da fronteira, e eu gostaria de perguntar a ela sobre como no cenário galês, inglês e na Europa se vê esse passado mitificado pelos americanos porque eu já vi livros didáticos de high school nos Estados Unidos e lá eles têm também esse tipo de história. A história que está no Red Dead Redemption está no, no livro de high school. E eu gostaria de saber como é que é essa percepção. Eu vou emendar as três perguntas. Para o professor... Posso? Posso emendar as três? Você que... Para o professor... Você não queria esperar primeiro para... Beleza, então vamos lá. Melhor para vocês. A primeira é para o professor Esther, né? 
Sim. Okay, uh, professor, professor Esther. Ok, uh, professor Christi, uh, Cristiano would like to ask you a question, and he, he asks like, as in the Welsh and European scenario, one sees the mythified American past. How can one see the mythified American past in, as in a Welsh, Welsh and European scenario? Um... I'm not sorry. I'm not entirely sure. So, are you talking about kind of like interpreting America from kind of a, a European or sort of um, British perspective or something? Like in terms of other interpretations of American history? Sorry, I I, I couldn't understand you. Um, do do are you kind of asking um in the sense of um how or what it means i suppose to interpret kind of american history from a kind of like british and european perspective in that sense yeah your perspective from your point of view in your country in your environment mm -hmm. is this methodological thing yeah um it's it's really interesting i think and it, it's something that rockstar in particular so it's like through the games and and sort of the the games that i study um they they kind of started out in a sense as a British company too, um, that have clearly taken on um the the kind of representation, the kind of understanding or the imagination of America that's come from American popular culture anyway. Um so I think the the sort of understanding very much uh, in, in some senses it's come the sort of understanding that um kind of British uh, or sort of more broadly European kind of contemporary kind of understandings they have of sort of American history comes very much from the the kind of the globalized sort of um, how do I kind of put it like the way that Hollywood sort of has represented kind of American history and how that has kind of been um, um, communicating more globally like American history becoming kind of global history in that sense so there's a very sort of um unquestioning I suppose understanding of, of American history that that comes a lot from the broader cultural myths about America that America through the American cultural industry like Hollywood film and other forms of popular culture that came out of kind of the the history of the West in particular, um, and these sort of big American genres like the like the Western. Um, that's, um, yeah, it, it's kind of repackaging American culture and selling it back to America with a sort of, in terms of rock star and games like Red Dead Redemption, a, a supposed British perspective on it in some ways, but really um, it's it's not a very, um, they haven't really been challenging very much about what America has been saying about itself, um, if that kind of um, makes sense and answers your question. Uh, tentando resumir, então, ela diz que é, essa parte de entendimento da, do, do europeu com os americanos, eles veem muito como se fosse a questão mesmo hollywoodiana, que eles não trabalham, eles percebem que eles não trabalham muito sobre a guerra mundial, mas sim eles partem da própria perspectiva americana, hollywoodiana, mais ou menos nesse sentido. Então, eles não têm tanta pesquisa nesse sentido, ao invés de entender que eles fazem isso de uma forma mais própria mesmo, que é uma coisa cultural americana mesmo. Uh, ok, Cristiano? O professor Nick... Weber, é, ele fala sobre a autenticidade, o que a autenticidade ela faz, por que ter essa autenticidade né, na sua apresentação. E eu particularmente concordo com ele e acho, achei interessante a parte que ele... Que ele identificou que essa autenticidade estar a serviço 
de alguma coisa. E um jogo que eu analisei tem, tem uma frase que eu acho que, que responde. Então, é, a minha pergunta é justamente se os jogos que ele analisou, se teria essa, essa resposta. Porque tem uma frase no Medal of Honor, Elijah Salt, que é You Don't Play, You Volunteer. Então, é Go War. É, a, ser, a autenticidade está a serviço de levar pessoas para empreitadas, para a guerra, para o lucro da indústria armamentista. Então, é, ele identificou a, a algum desses grandes grupos é, conectados, por exemplo, à guerra? Essa é a minha pergunta. Just a moment. Uh, Nick, professor Nick? Yeah. Okay, uh, professor Cristiano agreed with you when you talked about the authenticity, authenticity, and he would like to ask you, would games have this answer about authenticity aimed at something specific? Uh, for example, they work with something specific or they try to do that? in general? Is it in charge of general or in charge of something just for the game? So you mean in terms of um, are games able to do specific things authentic authentically, um, but general things are more problematic? I mean, that, that's that's what I understand I think you're asking. Um, yeah. my, my, my view on that, I think, would be that And, and actually this sort of refers to something that um, I think Max has said in the chat about the, the the situation really about authenticity, I think, is that authenticity is very much here being constructed by the beholder, by the viewer, by the player. And I think the problem that authenticity presents for us is that we, we as historians particularly, we come to these games and we come to these player communities thinking we know what authenticity means and thinking we know what players mean when they talk about it. And so can can some of, like, are there cases where games are doing something which players recognize as being authentic? I think definitely that there are, um, but I'm not necessarily sure that there, you know, I, that's not always the case. And we aren't always right when we make the judgment that we that we think that that something is authentic because players say so, because actually they might not be talking about the same thing we are. And I think that's the problem of the concept for me is it's it's really slippery, it's really poorly defined in its contemporary usage. Um, and I think there are some other options. I think that's what I'm I was trying to say in my piece. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Cristiano. Então, resumindo, ele diz que falar sobre autenticidade estar em, é, em algum algo específico vai depender também da visão do, da, do público, né, de quem está ah, jogando e aproveitando essa situação. Então, tem público que acha que a autenticidade está correta pela diversão, mas também tem um público que acha que a autenticidade ela está faltando. E para os historiadores, ele comenta que ao entrar nesse, nesse tipo de diálogo ou de pesquisa, eles também têm a visão da autenticidade ter, ter, ter que ser respeitada, porém, também trabalha com uma questão mercadológica, então fica muito difícil de especificar se a autenticidade ela está em jogo ou se é mesmo só para o mercado. É, para a professora Ruth Contreras... É, antes de mais nada, falar que eu torço para o Barcelona, porque o Barcelona, na Segunda Guerra Mundial, fez campanha contra o Franco. Então, é o meu time. Catalunha, Pátria Livre. Tamo junto. <risos> Professora, é, sobre a experiência com esses jogos, eu, eu, na minha, eu sou professor também, já fui professor de educação básica, dos mais novos, e quando eu usava cinema, filme, quando eu usava jogos e a criança, o adolescente, chegava em casa e os pais perguntavam o que, que foi ensinado hoje? Aí eles respondem, não, hoje não teve aula, hoje a gente só se divertiu, hoje a gente só brincou. E isso, mesmo entre os mais jovens, acaba sendo visto como um... um 
um não aprender, uma não educação, e é pelo contrário, né? Ah, você já esbarrou, pelo menos isso é assim no Brasil, na Espanha ou em outros países, você pode identificar também essa resistência, esse conservadorismo sobre o, a recepção né, do entretenimento, dos jogos, e parabéns pela produção do seu jogo. É isso. Obrigada por la pregunta. Eh, sí, pasa, nosotros empezamos a desarrollar esta colección de, de juegos digitales desde 2011. Entonces, ha sido todo un proceso muy largo eh, de ir picando piedra poco a poco para que, primero, eh, los profesores quisieran aceptar el juego en su aula. Eh, Además, eh, y en esto eh, el gobierno y lo que es eh, el Departamento de Educación nos ayudó mucho para que pudieran introducirse a los juegos en el aula. Creo que eso es un aspecto clave para que pudiera permitirse el que estuvieran dentro y los profesores pudieran aceptarlo. Eh, después, eh, los niños no hubo ningún problema por la aceptación eh, los padres quizá en algunos casos, como, como usted menciona, eh, pero realmente al ser un material educativo que está puesto en la página web y los profesores de hecho recomiendan que se utilice en, en, en casa y el material, eh, como mencioné, tenemos unas guías didácticas que ayudan cómo utilizar los juegos eh, y dan además más contenido que el que hay en el, en el juego, pues de alguna manera eso acaba viéndose como un contenido de educación más que puede usarse en el aula o en casa. Así que, pero sí, eh, tal como, como usted menciona al inicio, eh, fue un proceso difícil, estamos hablando 2011, 2013 más o menos, pero poco a poco, en base a hacer charlas, en base a, a que los profesores también se implicaran, se ha ido aceptando este recurso como un, eh, como un libro más o como cualquier otro recurso educativo. Obrigado. Uh, I will try to summarize for the other speakers. Uh, professor, professor Cristiano asked the prof Professor Root about the experience with the games she highlighted and if she could already identify the resistance to, conserv to conservatism uh, about the entertainment reception of the games. Uh, she talked about that, she, yes, she could be percept this resistance with their, their kids in, at home, but she also explained that uh, they made a job with uh, the community to, to highlight Hello, okay. Voltamos. Are we back? Voltamos sim, Rodrigo. Voltamos. Pode tocar o barco. Uh, did you listen to me? Because I, I didn't see if you we were disconnected. Um, I think we heard we heard most of what you said, but lost you at the end. Okay. Uh, she she summarized that the they made an effort to construct uh, an image, a good image for their games, so they could try to diminish the resistance to conservatism. But yes, uh, at the beginning she could. Uh, identify this kind of things. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Professor George, você quer fazer alguma fala ou já vamos partir para as perguntas gerais? Okay. Eu acho que nós vamos. Edson, vamos, vamos, vamos para o chat. Vamos para o chat. Okay. Então está challenging. Okay. Thank you. Uh... Agora a gente vai passar para o chat para algumas perguntas selecionadas. Eu vou fazer as 
eu vou fazer algumas perguntas e os professores podem se sentir à vontade em responder, mesmo que não seja, ou fazer algum comentário sobre alguma outra, ok? Uh, so now we are going to uh, bring some questions from the chat and be free to uh, answer which do you prefer or you want to comment some of them. I'm going to ask some questions and be free, ok? So, vamos lá. A primeira pergunta seria sobre os critérios para a melhor, melhor escolha dos jogos que poderão servir ao propósito da aprendizagem, aprendizagem história, histórica. So, the first question is, uh, how, oh, sorry, just a minute. Which criteria? Uh, Quer que eu faça a pergunta, Tatiana? Can be, can be. But okay. I have here. So, the first question. What are the, the, what are the criteria for the best choice of games that can serve the purpose of historical learning? Or, quais são os critérios para a melhor eleição de jogos que puedan servir para o aprendizagem histórico? Uh, this question can be answered by any of you, okay? Can, would you like me to repeat the question? Eh, no, eh, es claro, es claro. Eh, okay. En mi opinión, eh, los, los criterios son precisión histórica, es decir, es importante que los juegos se basen en una investigación exhaustiva y una representación eh, de, de los eventos históricos, la relevancia, es decir, eh, los juegos deben estar relacionados con temas históricos que sean relevantes, el nivel de dificultad también, pensando en el público objetivo o los estudiantes o para las personas que lo vayan a jugar en este sentido, para que tengan ese nivel para afrontarlo. La interactividad, eh, es decir, que tienen que permitir de acuerdo a esa edad o a, ese, a esas es, eh, eh, habilidades que tengan los jugadores, pues una interactividad correcta. Eh, contenido educativo, desde, también desde mi punto de vista, porque puede tener un, un contenido educativo explícito o, o no que permita ayudarles a aprender, o en este caso podía ser cambiado directamente eh, por eh, lo que es el contenido o, o relacionado con el primer punto que dije, que es la precisión histórica, y la accesibilidad, que es otro tema, ¿no? Los juegos deben de ser accesibles, eh, sobre todo si se quieren utilizar en un contexto de aprendizaje, como lo pone aquí Cleumar, eh, pues tienen que ser accesibles, estar disponibles para que puedan jugarlos dependiendo si es en el aula o si es en, en casa o en, en donde sea. Nosotros al principio cuando empezamos a hacer juegos eh, encontrábamos que los juegos que estábamos haciendo pues dependiendo de los computadores eh, que tuvieran en, en las escuelas no se podían utilizar. Entonces ya podíamos hacer el mejor juego del mundo con los mejores gráficos del mundo que si la, los computadores de las aulas no permitían utilizar ese tipo de, de tecnología o ese juego tan, pues no se podía uh, utilizar. Por tanto, la accesibilidad es muy importante. Ok, uh, I will try to, to point out the things she said. Uh, just point out the, the topics. She, she told that the relevance and the, the criteria for her, it would be uh, historical accuracy, the relevance of this, of this level of difficulty, educational content, and accessibility. That, uh, that were the points that she, that she thinks is relevant for the criteria and for the election. Uh, Tatiellen, quer fazer a próxima pergunta? Uh, let's go. Uh, how do we capture anachronism in these representations or perspectives of our present? Many historical games are emphasizing the demands on the present, especially identity. Então, como os capturamos esses anacronismos nas perspectivas no presente, né? E como esses muitos jogos históricos é, estão enfatizando essa no presente, especialmente a identidade. Esther, Nick, feel free. Um, I think in terms of thinking about um, understanding like anachronism and, you know, it, it can be useful for us to do because it allows us to understand these kinds of questions about the, what does history do with contemporary identity? What does history, what does the past 
mean and how can the past kind of be be used or is it used how the past is used to kind of um to negotiate our identities and our understanding of who we are and our place um in the present by by using the past so it's also it's kind of related to the the previous question about um, how we kind of choose games to how we select games um, to to use in different ways for you know in the context of education um, we might choose games that do have anachronisms or different kinds of inaccuracies to to study or to to engage with students because while they might not be allowing us to teach students um, accurate things about the past they allow us to or allow students to kind of develop those skills of critical historical literacy and understanding why things might be wrong or why we perceive that there are certain things about a game that are wrong um or anachronistic but what broader purpose is that serving um in in terms of trying to say something about the past and the present Okay, Nick, can, I just, can I add to that if, that is, if that's yeah. all right? Because I, I mean, I, I tend to hold the view that some of the best games to teach about history are actually not historical games, because um, I, I, I've written quite a lot about uh, games like Eve Online, science fiction games, um, and the thing that I think is really valuable in games is the way in which they encourage people to think historically whenever they're set, what, whatever period they're set in. And so things like anachronisms, things like alternate histories, force players, force students to think about why the narrative of history that we tell, why the story of history that we tell exists in the first place. Where does that come from? And how readily is it broken or challenged or interrogated? And of course, that's the process that we're always involved in as historians. So I think that that kind of that piece of critical knowledge is something that's quite hard to get students to develop organically. But you can create situations by using certain kinds of games that make them think about it without without you even having to help them almost, you know, because you put them into a situation where they have to work out why this is wrong or why this is different or why this challenge is what they expect. OK. Então... Ah, professor, please. Um, would like would like to uh, gost, gostaria de hablar, professora Ruth? No? Mm, nothing vou to add for my part. Eu vou, vou tentar só resumir aqui para sobre o que foi dito, tá? Uh, então, resumindo, uh, o anacronismo então ajuda a entender as questões como que o pass, uh, com o que o passado significa e como pode ser usado para para se negociar e entender como que a gente como estamos no presente. Ele também ajuda uh, no desenvolvimento de habilidades da crítica e saber o que é certo ou errado, é, partindo, por exemplo, de alunos ou de quem uh, trabalha com games ou até também quem joga, faz parte de, dos jogos. E ele também ajuda a pensar historicamente, independente da linha do tempo, e forçar o público a pensar se realmente existe isso, uh, se aquelas situações existiram e como o processo foi feito e planejado. Okay, Tatiellen. Uh, one more question, uma pergunta. Quais seriam as preocupações, preocupações que deveríamos tomar é, lidar com esse tipo de recurso, não recurso histórico, com reputação histórica? Uh, so, uh, just to point out, we have been debating about this, and for you, what precautions should we take when dealing with this type of resource? And historical representation. Uh, vou traduzir para a professora Ruth, né? A uh, a pergunta é: que tipo de precauções devemos tomar ao tratar da representação histórica? Or what kind of precautions should we be taking when dealing with the historical representation? Uh, feel free any one of you to to answer this. Nick, okay? I mean, I, I guess I've done it by accident, but OK. Um, <laughs> so, um, I, I mean, I, I think there are a number of precautions to take, but I don't I, I think actually there are there are some assumptions to challenge as well. And I think those are part of the precautionary framework that I think I would propose. Um, I, to some extent, people take don't take enough precautions when they read history in a book. And actually, a lot of the precautions 
um, taken towards historical representation in games uh, could also be applied to 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 thinking about how we how we engage with history written in books, how we engage how we engage with traditional forms of historical writing, historical production. Um, so I think there are some core challenges there in just being much more critical about the representation we see in games, and so taking those things as precautions, but also the core precaution with entertainment games specifically is that they are sold as entertainment and that shapes their space of production. It shapes the accommodations and decisions that game makers make. Um, and those are really important things to bear in mind as we look at them. You know, they are products. We are being sold this um, and we are being sold it because it is expected that we will buy it. Would you like to make to make any comments there? Um, I think Nick said it pretty well, actually. Um, just you know, it's it's the kind of thing that I try and teach my students, no matter what game they are looking at, um, to always think critically of the kinds of historical arguments and assumptions that are being made. So that's the kind of precaution that, even if you know, these these games are being sold as entertainment, they're being sold as um they're still being sold as authentic to some extent or they're using authenticity or claims of authenticity to give them value so we always need to be critical about um and take these kind of um yeah uh, analytical precautions i suppose in in challenging the kinds of assumptions they are maybe making implicitly um or more explicitly through through marketing and things like that so okay Bueno, además de, lo, sí, además de lo que se ha dicho, eh, pues creo quizá llevándolo hacia el tema de los serious game, eh, pues considerar objetividad y subjetividad, es decir, las fuentes, las representaciones históricas que pueden ser tanto objetivas como subjetivas, dependiendo de la perspectiva de, de la persona que esté creando un juego. Eh, Dependiendo de, de la perspectiva del creador, puede ser la representación, ¿no? De, de hecho, no hay muchos estudios que hablan de, de, este, de este tema. Es importante considerar esa objetividad y subjetividad de la fuente, eh, que, que es la que está evaluando la precisión y utilidad eh, que quiere de la historia que quiere poner dentro de, del juego. Creo que, que en ese sentido, considerar la objetividad y subjetividad... Eh, paralelamente a verificar la precisión y la autenticidad de todos los contenidos, pues es de alguna manera considerar mm, diversas perspectivas para una comprensión completa y más precisa. Ok, uh, just to try to summarize in English. Uh, she, also, she also mentioned uh, the things you've said about precautions, representations, subjectivity of the... Of, of what are going to be, uh, what is going to be on the game uh, and about precision. So uh, to summarize, she also mentioned the things you also said. Uh, we've just got 15 minutes. Okay, Georgie. We just got 15 minutes. Uh, I think we have uh, just one more question. Is that okay? Uh, mais uma pergunta, Professor Georgie? Sim, sim, é minha vez agora. Vou, vou fazer uh, uma pergunta. Sim. Tá? Okay. Ah, primeiro, né, extraordinárias as falas, né, coisas que nós estamos discutindo aos poucos. Eu quero fazer uma pergunta que serve para os três, para que nós possamos fechar isso. Na verdade, é muito simples. A pesquisa que vocês fizeram e fazem, qual é o nível de participação de historiadores na produção dos jogos? Desses jogos de cunho histórico. E uma segunda questão que, que completa essa. Se nós cobrarmos uma autenticidade histórica, não estaríamos tirando a liberdade poética do jogo enquanto produto da cultura e da arte? Só, só isso aí, vocês respondam. Só, só, o Jorge, só é, repete a sua segunda parte da pergunta. Uh, se cobrarmos uma autenticidade histórica, não estaríamos tirando a, a liberdade poética do jogo enquanto produto da cultura e assim entendido como arte? Ok. 
Uh, let me see. Professor George asked, uh, what's the level of participation of the history teachers in the games you produce? And he also asked, if we demand historical authenticity, wouldn't that take away the poetic freedom of the game? I mean, I'm, I'm nodding because I, I agree that absolutely it would. Like any any constraint like that um, limits the space of play. Um, and a lot of player arguments about things like accuracy turn on this discussion because they players will say things like, I want an accurate video game. And then somebody will respond, yes, but if you have an accurate video game, you're talking about a film because you won't get to interact. You won't get to do anything because all of the information is already decided. Um, authenticity then gets argued about sometimes as providing more space for, for players to do things. Um, but one of the reasons that I am, as I say, so keen on, on non-historical games to think about history is because those constraints don't exist. You don't have to constrain the game by knowledge that we believe we have about the past because we're describing a world which is fictional. And so we can start with a set of fictional materials and we can do something that's even less constrained than anything that's grounded in, in a, a, a genuine, as it were, historical account. Okay, Esther, you can. Um, yeah, I, I think it's interesting, this relationship between kind of historical authenticity and poetic license i think very often when developers use this idea of historical authenticity when they're marketing a game they are using it to kind of give themselves almost one step remove or or they use it differently to the way they use historical accuracy because this term authenticity almost means that they do get a bit more kind of potential kind of poetic license that they are making something in the spirit of something real but because it's supposedly authentic not just accurate it allows them that little kind of space of, of freedom to do something that is um more um kind of inventive or perhaps in, um, more fictionalized to make something a, a better game rather than making it a kind of uh, a better history so yeah i don't know if i have a a good answer for it i guess there's an interest there is an interesting tension between these kind of demands for authenticity that um, a historian would make a developer would make or players would make and the the idea that these games are always going to be to some level fictional anyway um, and are always going to need to um create and incorporate fictionalization so where is the line between these demands for kind of authenticity um, and this idea of you know creative or poetic or artistic license um yeah it's it's a good question um and sort of there's a lot of ways of thinking about how we might understand this relationship between these two things i guess okay i i think uh okay prof uh, professor esther la pregunta es cuál es el nivel de participación de los historiadores en los proyectos que participa Y si exigimos una autenticidad histórica, ¿no retiraría eso la libertad poética del juego? Profesora Ruth. Sí, perdona, que estaba en silencio. Eh, bueno, pues creo que no hay mucho más que añadir eh, de lo que ya han comentado Esther y Nick. Eh, Creo en este sentido que eh, pues yo, yo creo que no, 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 casi lo han dicho todo. Es decir, eh, en, en este sentido no, no creo que haya nada más que añadir. Lo siento. Y sobre la participación de historiadores en los proyectos que participan, ¿cuál es el nivel de participación? Pues su nivel de participación dependerá mucho también de, volviendo al tema de los juegos serios, de, lo, de los, de los jugadores, del diseñador. Eh, te puedo decir nuestro caso en concreto. Nuestro caso en concreto, pues básicamente nosotros trabajamos con historiadores. Todos los juegos que nosotros hacemos, 
eh, las realizamos con diseñadores, con, perdón, con historiadores. En el caso de juegos AAA o cualquier otro tipo de juegos que estén dentro de las empresas, deberá, dependerá de las eh, implicaciones, ventas eh, que quiera tener cada uno de los estudios. Eh, Esa es, eso es mi, básicamente la, la, mi percepción. No todos los estudios están eh, dispuestos a sacrificar ciertas cosas de ficción, porque dentro, como puse en mi ejemplo, en algunos casos, si se sigue a nivel histórico al 100%, pues muchas de las mecánicas se ven comprometidas y por tanto como diseñador de juegos, pues eh, no, es, no siempre se puede seguir un, con precisión al 100% porque sacrificas otras cosas, eh, como en el caso del entretenimiento. Ok, muchas gracias. Uh, ahora, como nuestro tiempo está acabando, vamos a pasar entonces para los comentarios finales. Now let's uh, go to closing comments. Vamos para los comentarios finales. Eu gostaria de convidar o professor Cristiano para fazer os seus comentários. É, gostaria de agradecer a presença de todas as pessoas, dos convidados, das convidadas, e destacar a importância de estudarmos sobre as representações sobre a historicidade presente nos videogames, porque mais do que nunca vivemos uma era de fake news, onde há uma série de simulacros divulgando aspectos históricos que estão cada vez mais distantes da realidade, distantes da história e usando justamente a simbologia da história para tentar nos convencer de coisas que de fato não aconteceram. As democracias dependem de estudos da comunicação, história, e elas, é, elas dependem muito de pesquisas, universidades, estudantes, e precisamos construir um futuro é, com esperança a partir de todas essas pesquisas. Ok. Professor Jorge, gostaria de fazer algum comentário? Professor Jorge, would you like to make any comment? Não, não, não é necessário. Não? Pode, não, pode passar bem. para os colegas convidados que nós encerramos. Eu estou aqui só para trabalhar, oh. eu não vou falar nada. Beleza. Ok. Uh, so, your closing comments, Professor Esther, Nick. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, it's been really interesting to kind of hear the different kind of perspectives on this um, from from both the kind of more like entertainment side of things, but also some of the the ways this relates to more serious games as well. Um, so yeah, just um, I guess really happy to be part of the the discussion and having the kind of questions and, and follow up and things. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Nick. Yeah, just to say thank you is obrigado, is that right? I don't know. Um, yes. But thank you, everybody, right. for, for putting this together and um, for, for bringing us into this discussion. As Esther says, it's been it's been really interesting to have, have the discussion, see the range of perspectives. Um, and also, it's really nice to see so many people excited about this area of work because it's, it's obviously, I mean, from my perspective, it's a really important developing area and it's going to be an area which grows very quickly. Um, so I think it's, a, it's really interesting to see how many people here are excited about this discussion. Okay, Professor Ruth. Bueno, yo solo quiero cerrar con diciendo que es importante que los juegos, en el caso de los juegos serios, aborden temas históricos y lo hagan de manera responsable, tomando en cuenta pues los hechos que están documentados, evita, eh, evitando lo que es negacionismo histórico, ¿no? Como se ha ido comentando. Eh, es necesario que haya una representación precisa y respetuosa de, de todo lo que es la, la historia. Eh, y en donde mejor puede pasar esto es en los juegos serios. Lamentablemente en temas, en juegos de entretenimiento, pues en estos no siempre se puede garantizar, pero sí que yo creo que cada vez más se logra que, que en los mismos juegos AAA haya eso, ¿no? una comprensión de los eventos o por lo menos se, se, se fomenta el intentar que haya un acercamiento uh, de manera responsable y crítica. Gracias por la invitación. Uh -huh.
Então, pessoal, a gente está chegando ao fim. Gostaria de agradecer a todos pela participação, pelos comentários. O vídeo ficará disponível depois com, com as traduções, os subtítulos. Uh, e não esqueçam de seguir as nossas redes do Mitex no Instagram, no Twitter, uh, no Facebook. Uh, cliquem, comentem e vamos para lá. So thank you very much for being with us. Uh, we'd like to finish with great. Oh my God. Are you listening? Okay, thank you very much for being with, here with us. I just, okay. Uh, Tachelin, thank you. Professor, thank you. So that's it. Thank okay. you.